Alright, hello everyone. Oh, no, Thanks for uh, coming to my session today. Hello everyone out there in TV land. Um, my name is William Bartram. I'm the executive director of Disc Northwest. Um, and I'm uh, glad you came today. I hope uh, this session is useful for you. Hope you enjoy it. Um, I want to start off um, first with a show of hands. How many people uh, out here are coaches? It's a coaching conference, yay. Um, how many people have been a tournament director or a league coordinator? A couple. Uh, any board members out there? Other kind of ultimate volunteers? Yeah. <laughs> any players? Anybody still play? Yay. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Okay, so this is a good crowd. I like it. <coughs> um, so the goal of my presentation is to provide coaches with perspectives on youth ultimate uh, programs, and this will entail a very brief overview of um, what we do in Seattle. Um, we'll include a framework for the ongoing development of youth programs um, that can apply to any location, uh, and will be a discussion of ways to strengthen uh, local coaching communities. Uh, questions are welcome at any time, um, uh, but I am planning to leave uh, time at the end uh, to take some questions because I think that'll be uh, a real valuable part of the presentation. So, uh, and this presentation will be somewhat Seattle-centric. Um, but I hope it provides insight to, uh, to, to, to wherever you're from. And in Seattle, uh, Youth Ultimate Play was all, it was all coach-driven in the beginning. Uh, people like Mary Lowry, Dan Costigan, Joe Bisignano formed teams independently at their schools. They were teachers. They made teams. They later discovered uh, each other, found out that they, they were all making teams at their schools. Um, they worked to recruit even more teams um, and started to organize scrimmages uh, against their schools and they really built the youth scene from scratch. Uh, to help recruit more teams, uh, Mary would send out newspaper clippings, this is back before the internet, um, and uh, she'd make photocopies of the rules and she would send it to PE teachers at all the schools in town with a little note, you know, hey, you know, use this or pass it on if there's somebody else in your school that knows what Ultimate is. And uh, over time, um, a league developed. Um, they, they began some structured play with the middle school league in the early 1990s. Um, as those middle school players got older, got into high school, they wanted to keep playing, so they did, and they, uh, they started their own high school teams. Uh, not long thereafter, uh, Mary and Jeff Jorgensen and Joe Bisignano started Spring Rain, and uh, around this time, uh, Disc Northwest was formed by Joey Gray and some other folks, and uh, early on, the organization was more focused on uh, adult ultimate than youth ultimate. Is Spring Rain a youth tournament? Spring Rain is a youth tournament. Biggest one in the world, I think. Biggest one in the world. Biggest one right in the world. Up. We'll talk about it more later on. Um, but uh, so fast forward a few years, Mike Mullen and Roger Crafts uh, started the summer camps in 2004. Uh, and they did this originally in partnership with uh, Seattle Parks. Um, they started with a small camp for 40 players. and. About 10 years later, um, still under their leadership and in partnership now with Disc Northwest, uh, the camp serves over 900 campers uh, in the summer. Um, as I said, Disc Northwest um, began by focusing on adult events, but the mission always uh, advocated for the promotion of the sport at all levels. And over time, Disc Northwest assumed management of youth programs. Disc Northwest provided a website, um, registration tools, insurance, um, later took on administrative responsibilities um, and uh, communication, scheduling, customer service tasks, and so on. Uh, the first full-time staff member was hired in uh, 2004, and since then we have hired uh, additional staff with the most recent hiring of a half-time administrative assistant. We're now at three and a half uh, FTE, It's pretty cool. Um, and now Dish Northwest serves as the organized body organizational body so that coaches uh, can focus on coaching. That's uh, not event management. And that's going to be a recurring theme in my presentation here. Um, and this is partnership between the organization and the coaches that, that helps the scene thrive. You know, for example, we wouldn't have 32 teams in our spring elementary school league if it weren't for the hard work that this Northwest does to, to manage the logistics. But by the same token, the league wouldn't be thriving <coughs> and, and growing if not for more than 50 coaches who put in a ton of work every spring to, to bring their teams to the fields. 
So uh, as I said, Programming Youth Ultimate is integral to our mission, which is to serve as a regional resource, promoting growth in the sport of Ultimate and instilling the spirit of sportsmanship at all levels of play. So uh, as Dish Northwest got more involved in the management of Youth Ultimate, um, financial stability was not always a priority for, for youth programs. Uh, the organization relied on financial success of uh, adult leagues um, to help fill our mission and, and, and run, run more youth uh, activities. Um, now this has changed and currently many youth programs break even and, and uh, some make money and some programs, uh, though are mission rich, um, do lose money for the organization, but that's okay. Because we're not a profit. So the vast majority of revenues um, uh, are received from participation fees, but nevertheless, fundraising has become a priority. Uh, the Youth Development Fund, it's a restricted fund that was established to help solicit donations, and uh, these, money, uh, these monies allow us to provide financial aid um, and run important mission-rich programs um, that might be budget poor otherwise. So operationally, most of what we do at Dish Northwest falls into one of four main categories, leagues, camps, tournaments, and elite play, club play. Uh, we also organized a fundraising event in the fall, and we hosted a youth summit um, uh, last year as a structured way to collect feedback from the community, but for the sake of time, I want to uh, focus on uh, these main categories. So <coughs> leagues, um, how, how a lot of this started, uh, they perform very well from a financial standpoint and are also an excellent opportunity for kids to play the sport. Our main season is in the spring. We run co-ed leagues for elementary school, middle school, and high school teams. And these are all uh, for school-based teams I'm talking about right now in the spring. Um, and they're all co-ed. We do offer some single-gender uh, middle school play, um, kind of figuring out the right format for that. Um, high school single-gender play has evolved, and currently um, high school boys and girls leagues are managed and organized by coaches and athletic directors. Um, the boys play in the fall, the girls play in the spring. Uh, District Northwest may become more involved with uh, those structures in the near future, though. Uh, one cool um, example, one unique example, um, <coughs> is our fall middle school league. Um, this, run, this league is run in partnership with Seattle Public Schools. It started when Joey Gray and some others lobbied the district to use funds from the Families and Education Levy. And uh, the school district then pays for fields, they pay for coaching stipends, um, courtesy of funds from the levy. And school principals love this because it comes from the district budget, not from their own budget. And it's a great after-school program um, for their kids. And uh, players love it because it's a great way to participate in a high-quality ultimate league. Just Northwest, we provide expertise and scheduling, free discs and stuff like that. Yeah. Do the leagues run simultaneously, the Just Northwest Code Leagues, the yeah. single gender and this, leagues? And the, the, yeah, everything happens in the spring. Our co ed leagues mostly run on Saturdays. Some of the single gender stuff will be on weekdays, but I mean, you know, a lot, all that happens in the spring. Um, except for the boys that play in the fall, and, the, and this, this public school league happens in the fall. Um, finally, there's some uh, club playing opportunities that we provide our, our boys' spring club league. Um, it's somewhat small, but it's pretty stable. Um, and we, we call it a club league, but most teams actually uh, are based on uh, their school affiliations. That's okay. Um, we have an early summer league that leads towards our YCC participation. Uh, and this year we just started a new winter club league that is very popular with the U16 crowd. Summer camps is another programming category and they're very successful as a learning program and also financially. Uh, in 2013, the camps brought in $255,000 worth of revenue and had $150,000 in expenses. Uh, we also awarded over $16,000 in financial aid uh, to kids who needed it, and we spent another $4,000 on uh, free camps uh, that were run in South Seattle for kids that couldn't even make it up to North Seattle. Uh, kids, Madison Park is where we run most of our stuff, and that's in North Seattle. Um, we run three weeks of day camps that run from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, two in June, one in August. Uh, the camp directors hire counselors, leads, and volunteers to run the camps. The, and the, the directors, camp directors, the counselors, and the leads are all paid for their work. Uh, these camps are more popular with the middle school players than with uh, high school players, we found. Uh, but to help better serve the, the older population, the more elite player, we're working to add a leadership and elite skills component to the 2014 camps uh, for the high school players, and we're working with Lou Burris, who's going to help us implement that. We think it's going to be really cool, so we have high hopes for 
Maybe for that, if you, if you know, you know he's, a, he's a very skilled coach. Uh, we also work with Sam Terry to run three weeks of free camps, as I mentioned, in South Seattle uh, for kids that can't make it up. Uh, Mike and Roger have really done a fantastic job uh, developing the camps, and it's a, it's a great program for the Seattle uh, Youth Ultimate players. We benefit, this Northwest benefits from having great relationships with a lot of different vendors. Um, we, you know, to find our trainers and our coaches, we, and, uh, and uh, we love working with Seattle Parks to host it there at Magnuson. So tournaments. Uh, in the past, we've run a number of tournaments, but most uh, have been discontinued. It's hard to find a, a good sustainable model. Um, smaller events are not usually profitable, and that's okay, uh, but uh, they usually serve the teams that uh, already have playing opportunities, So, uh, and they take a lot of energy to organize. So what we're moving towards is spending our scarce resources to develop playing opportunities to help those players that don't have as many opportunities rather than to continue to serve the teams that are that are already having uh, uh, good, good outlets. So uh, that being said, Spring Rain is a long-running, uh, very successful tournament for us, uh, and, I, and I believe it's the biggest one in the world. Until somebody tells me otherwise, I'm going with it. Um, and I plan to talk more about Spring Rain uh, later in more detail. How many teams? Well, we're expecting 96 this year, eight elementary school to play a one-day, uh, 40 middle school and 48 high school. Although, depending on interest, we may flip maybe 48 middle school and 40 high school, depending on how it goes. And when is that one? April 26, 27 this year. Last week of April. Last week in April. That's a good one. All right. So, Elite Play, the, uh, the history of this really begins with MOHO, um, which started in the late 1990s. Um, at that time, the team was not really affiliated with Disc Northwest, um, and the early MOHO teams competed in... Uh, the then called UPA High School Championships. It was before there were uh, the same kind of regional divides and eligibility rules and things that there are now. Is that one high school? That was high school, yeah, high school players. Okay. But it started, it started when a group of middle school players, mostly from NOMS, New, New Options Middle School, graduated with high school, some went to different schools, and they wanted to keep playing together, and they did so under this, this team name of MOHO. And the concept of MOHO, it, it evolved and it became a uh, more of a training program as the team stopped traveling to tournaments and, and uh, excellent coaches in the area, including uh, Ben and uh, Miranda, who are here today, were former Moho coaches. Um, and uh, it, was, it was always open to the kids that were, wanted to learn and, and develop as players. Um, and over time, this Northwest became to manage that program and, and the training opportunities. Uh, interest has waned over the last few years, but the spirit of the, that program still guides uh, a lot of what we do today. And nowadays, our player, elite player development is geared around YCC. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we run a, an early summer club league um, that serves as a lead-in to the YCC competition, the championships in Minnesota. Um, the league incorporates the YCC teams as well as other players that seek a high-level playing and learning opportunity. Uh, so we manage this. Uh, we have a, a hiring committee that oversees the selection of YCC coaches. Uh, the coaches then select assistants who are approved by the hiring committee. Coaches are all compensated by Dis Northwest. The coaches manage tryouts, conduct the practices, and travel with the team to the championship. Um, we're currently in the process of changing the hiring process for the YCC coaches. Um, and along with that, we're updating their uh, roles and responsibilities and expectations to make that a more sustainable uh, and manageable program. Dis Northwest sets the YCC budget. Uh, we manage the player fees, book all the transportation and lodging, order the uniforms, manage all the logistics. Um, so again, so the coaches can focus on coaching, and we can do the administration. Uh, one of our staff members, the operations manager, Rusty Brown, usually serves as the general manager to help coordinate all the logistics. And um, we feel that this structure is the best fit for the players and coaches uh, and for Disc Northwest. And so organizations like ours provide a lot of programs, but as the community grows, um, there will be gaps and corresponding new opportunities, um, places where leaders in the community can create new programs. Um, you know, we used to have to work really hard to create any new opportunity to play in Seattle, and, and we still do, but um, now there are so many choices um, that players really require something special from, it, from a new program. Um, it has to really serve a need or else it won't be successful. And, um, some other groups, fortunately, are finding ways to fill those gaps and to create new programs. 
uh, uh, Fry's are one of them. Um, Age Up is another one. Those are outstanding programs, um, and I encourage you to check them out. Um, discussion of those programs would be a great presentation topic all on their own, so maybe next year we can get some of those folks down here. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much, but in short, um, Fry's was started by Randy Lim to help serve the elite players in the area. They've always had excellent coaches. Um, over 200 players attended the tryout this year, um, and they travel to uh, play teams across the country. It's a super cool program, and it really fills a need for, for the, those higher-level players that are seeking better coaching, high-level instruction that they, that they don't always get at the school team level. Um, and, and I also want to mention uh, Updog and Fall Drizzle, which are one-day tournaments or, organized by uh, UW Element and Western Washington uh, Chaos, the women's teams, uh, respectively. Uh, those events are scheduled outside of the main uh, spring season, uh, and they started those at a time when there was increasing demand for more year-round playing opportunities. So they found that, saw that opportunity, saw that niche, and they filled it. And, uh, and it's, those, those programs have been very successful. What are we doing here on time? Oh, perfect. So ultimate is a sport with uh, great potential. However, there are many hurdles to continued increases in participation and, and development of programs. Um, and in my opinion, the build up and they will come model uh, may work in the short term, but long term growth requires a little more planning and thought. And there's some, uh, and just uh, you know, side note, there's some great new ideas about delivering innovative programs to youth players like the, the Rise Up, the education stuff that they're doing, and so on. Ultimate Peace is doing great stuff. Um, some of those folks are here this weekend. Uh, but but I'm, I'm going to focus on. Uh, Youth Ultimate programs that are that are more based at a local or, or regional level. So if you want to learn how to make the next rise up, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you. Um, so uh, sports that are part of the traditional school sports structure have some advantages um, that Ultimate does not have. Uh, so there's they have a, a more stable, comprehensive structure that ensures continued uh, viability of those sports in the schools. And this is bolstered by a greater amount of media, and I, you know, this comes in the form of uh, coverage in the local press, as well as uh, the availability of coaching resources, um, and uh, not as much of a deal this, these days, but the ability to easily watch high-level performers, high-level players perform on the field. Um, we're getting more and more videos all the time now, but I remember when I started, you could probably watch all the recorded Ultimate in a weekend, <laughs> but that's... Not the case anymore. Thank, thank goodness. It's a big fine leap of playing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at the school level, um, and not the club level, but the school level, school-based structures, there's not a, always a great need to, to change or to innovate. Uh, but on the flip side, ultimate programs are built upon uh, newer structures and practices. Uh, we can adapt to meet the needs of local players in ways that traditional school sports do not. Uh, we have our own opportunities and unique assets. Self-officiating spirit of the game are great tools. Um, great tools for delivering a sport to youth players, um, and they help us to sell the sport to parents and school administrators. Ultimate benefits from a passionate community uh, and organizers who are willing to put their feet on the field to help promote the sport <coughs> in a youth setting, in a club sports setting, whereas, as opposed to a varsity sports setting. Uh, so, but because the players, the playing structures aren't as rigid as they are for other sports, ultimate coaches and players often expect their programs to be. Uh, very accommodating, and they should. Um, and 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 the, and the programs are usually more flexible, but perhaps also less stable because we're constantly innovating. Um, and setting priorities for our programs can be a really big challenge. Uh, and and it's and it's a challenge to serve a, a really varied community. So there's there's differences from state to state, city to city, uh, with regards to the level of organization and the development of youth programs. Uh, smaller groups in cities with nascent youth scenes require more inclusive structures uh, to promote participation. But more mature teams in, in uh, bigger areas prefer more standardized experience for their players. There's also varying levels of school support. Some school administrators uh, embrace it because they see how great it is for their kids. And they award letters and so on, put them in sports ceremonies at the end of the year. But uh, others want nothing to do with ultimate because they already have enough to deal with and they see it as another hassle. Some schools help you find fields, and some would prefer that you just went somewhere else. Schools in urban areas benefit from having competition close by. Schools in rural areas may need to travel long distances in order to find competition. 
early registration deadline, uh, and subsequent release of schedules is great for the established organized schools, but it's difficult for newcomers and folks just trying to, to get a team together for the first time. Double headers are good for big rosters, uh, and also good for smaller teams. Uh, so organizers want to be inclusive and flexible, but at the same time, um, we need to aim to provide long-term stability for teams and organizations and, and groups. And this is a real balancing act. So in this context, let's take a look at how youth programs can be organized. I have a little Venn diagram here. So it's important to have a clear picture of your available resources, your customers, and your desired goals when you're creating a new event. So uh, for your resources, understanding your capabilities can help you figure out how to leverage your scarce resources effectively uh, to create specifically tailored programs to meet the demands. And this includes your financial resources. You know, it's important to know whether your programs need to make money uh, or whether you can run it at a loss. Um, you know, evaluate your human resources. You know, are you able to recruit parents and, and uh, volunteers to help, or do you have paid staff members that can that can help with that? And as we all know, uh, access to good field space is definitely a scarce resource that you have to consider. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a wide variety of youth teams, and so it's important to program accordingly and understand your customers. Uh, you know, you have to figure out if you want the event to serve everyone in the area or just a subset. Uh, should it serve the high-level teams or, or the newbies? Do you want eight-year-olds, elementary school kids, or is it just for high school kids? And finally, organizers sh should define their goals for the event. You know, is the focus competition, instruction? Uh, are you trying to maximize playing time? Maybe you're trying to introduce the sport to new audiences. Uh, or maybe it's some combination of those. You should consider your desired outcomes for the event. You know, is it important to crown a champion or... Is it more important to promote spirit of the game? And those aren't mutually exclusive, of course, but prioritizing one or the other will dictate some of the other decisions that you make later on during the planning process. So uh, what are some of those decisions that you have to make? Well, organizers have to navigate through a series of event components uh, that aid in the development programs. Pick your format. You're going to run a league, a tournament, camp, uh, glorified pickup, competition structures, how many, how many games per day or per weekend are you going to schedule, um, team format, is it bring your own team, is it, is it a hat league, people know what I mean by hat league, sign individual sign-ups, is it a pod where you just bring a couple of friends together and then get rushed together in a team, where are you going to have it, in town, north of town, if it's a league, or can you do it the same site every week or do you have to bounce around, day of the week, time of day, time of year, avoid graduations, proms, math championships, SATs, holidays, <coughs> so on. Uh, eligibility is a big one. Um, what's the age format? Is it based on age or grade? Uh, is it school-based or club-based? How do you manage free agents? How do you manage the kid that doesn't have a team? Um, quick side note for, for some, some areas that may not have developed youth, or youth scenes or even adult scenes, uh, all ages events are something to consider um, to create more opportunities for play and in order to, to help you build a nice community but then you have some different kinds of liability issues that you would need to consider if you do that. Gender, of course, co-ed, single gender. If it's co-ed, what is it? 4-3, offense calls, 5-2. What's the right thing? Registration, you know, a lot of us have, a lot of, there's a lot of website resources out there that are, that are, that are set up, but um, you still need to pick one and go with it and establish some registration and payment deadlines. Paperwork, of course, ultimate. Not a very litigious society, but uh, still got to monitor your, monitor your liability there. As well as uh, educate people. We have a list at law in Washington, which is, uh, deals with concussions, concussion protocol. And there's, part of it is a, is, a, is a liability piece for the school districts, but it's also uh, done in such a way that it's a great education piece for the players, the coaches, and the parents to understand more about concussions. And I, uh, from firsthand, it's really made me think about it a lot more, so um, I think that's a good thing. Scheduling, do you do double headers at leagues? How do you deal with potential mismatches and you know, lopsided scores? Uh, if you want to uh, avoid those, maybe that comes at the expense of scheduling more rematches, scheduling the same teams over and over again. How do you determine number of games at a tournament, number of games in a season, managing playoff seating, etc. And then you have a management structure, who does what, who's in charge of scheduling, who does communication, 
uh, you get more advanced, you can think about financial aid and stuff like that. Somebody's got to be in charge of all that, right? So do all that kind of stuff, and then you're good to go. You finally get your event, and it's the best one ever. Speaking of the best ultimate event ever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I want to use Spring Main as an example. I kind of walk through some of that framework in this context to give you kind of an understanding. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the characteristics, but a few important ones. So um, first of all, our customers, we, we're aiming for regional participation for ages 8 through 19. That's a, that's a lot. Um, but we really feel it's important to, to do that. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's our base, that's our uh, customer base. Resources, we have a lot of physical uh, uh, resources. We've got a locker full of stuff. We've got full-time staff that work at the event. We are easily able to uh, find tournament directors to help with other bits of the event. Plus, we get dozens of volunteers. Uh, again, uh, a lot of time the Western team come down uh, and helps out. We get league teams to come. Huck and Easy has been one that's coming out every year and does a great job. A lot of parents help out. And we have uh, financial support from the organization to make it a success. So we're lucky in that area. And, our, and our main, one of our main goals is to celebrate community. Uh, we think it's important to, and this, this ties in with our, our customers, you know, we think it's really important to celebrate who we are in the Northwest, to, have, to play ultimate and have a good time doing it, and to really enjoy um, this, this weekend together. So what are some of the characteristics? Um, this is for school-based teams. We do allow some roster exceptions. Uh, but in general, we find that we want to we promote school-based teams. That's how most teams are organized um, in our area. And so it makes the most sense to, to keep the event in that structure. It helps maintain sustainable structures for players to know that year after year there's going to be a school-based team. So catering to that group, is, we think, is helping the, the, the sport in the long run. Like, you know, we do have an eligibility committee, so we do allow for some free agents or some consortiums to form. So, for example... The, there's a really fun team that comes from Montana, and, uh, but they're from a small city, and the kids come from three different schools. And normally, you know, if it was from Seattle, we wouldn't let that happen. But, I mean, they're, they, they have 20 kids that play in their whole town, and they come from three different schools. So, yes, of course, yes, you can come this spring and play. That's great. And it's, and it's really helping them. Yeah. Do you do online rostering, or do you use USA Ultimate we're, Sanction? We're not, we're not USA Ultimate Sanction. We are now this year moving to all online rosters. So in the past, there was more paper. Mm -hmm. waivers and rosters. Uh, we've implemented some new technology, so uh, this year we have, we're doing online rosters and corresponding online waivers. <laughs> it's going to be sweet. I hope. Um, competition structure. So we have fewer games than a lot of tournaments have because a lot, of, a lot of teams travel. We have regional participation, right? Team from Montana comes, you know, Boise, Oregon. A lot of Vancouver teams come down. It's a team that flies in from uh, Manitoba every year, which is pretty cool. But so we have this travel requirements. We have to finish by 2.30 on Sunday. Um, so we, we, we schedule no more than three games per day per team uh, and no more than six per the weekend. Some teams will only get five because we don't play out all the consolation games. We used to schedule them out, but then we realized a lot of them didn't get played anyway. So, um, so that's, that's a component, but that's kind of one of the concessions that we make in order to achieve our goals. Gender is 4-3 with roster requirements. Again, one of our goals is to build community, and there's a strong tradition and history of co-ed play in the Northwest we want to celebrate that. Um, we want to uh, pr promote the social aspects of, of Ultimate as well, and having a co-ed tournament does that. We have a strict 4-3 ratio, and we even have some roster requirements. You need to have at least I think it's six girls on your roster you need to show up. It's not, really, it's not really cool to show up with three girls and expect them to play every point. So um, That's our way to deal with that. Uh, very congested spring schedule. As I said, it's last weekend of April has bounced around a little bit before. But we're kind of settled on that date. Uh, we avoid most of the problems, and SATs is usually the weekend after and this kind of stuff, but we found that it actually sits right on usually the same weekend as a big uh, middle school math tournament, so some kids have to choose academics or athletics. Um, tough choice. That's life. I think I, I was really into math when I was a kid, so I may have and sports, so that would have been hard for me, but what can you do? Spring breaks are really hard to schedule around because, again, we have regional participation. Everybody's got a different spring break. Um, we're never going to please everybody. We try. Um, registration, again, we have strict deadlines. Our bid window opened <coughs> this morning, I think, for spring May, or maybe next week. Uh, so we have a bid window that opens up. People submit their bids. We have a, a committee that 
selects bids. It's not first come, first serve. We try to serve as many teams as we can in, in a fair way. You know, sometimes we have to put teams on a wait list and so on. But again, some teams that get a bid don't take it. So we have to leave enough team for this wait list of teams to accept. It's really hard to get a team to play with just two days notice in a big tournament like this. So we have to enforce some, some strict deadlines for registration and payment. And uh, from a management perspective, uh, Wynn Sheriff, our director of youth operations, is, is in charge of the whole thing. She manages several tournament directors, dozens of volunteers, like I said, and, and we've started our planning meetings for this event in the fall. So it's a long timeline. Right. So basically, like, if, if kids in school just get together and they're like, they're like, okay, we'll, we'll get ten guys and six girls and we make a team. That's what they basically do. They can. And they can just name whatever they can come up with whatever name for the team again. Wow. Yeah, we you know we on the on the schedule we, we you know list us by school and we you know try to do that, but to to check eligibility as best we can. We do require coaches so that kids can't just come bring bring themselves. They need some some adult supervision. Um, but essentially, yeah, they can do they can do that. Submit a bid, uh, and uh, some do it with or without the um, sanctioning of their school. So sometimes we have to. They're like, our school doesn't want us to cross the border, so we're just coming. Can you put something else in the program? Yes, put some other name on there. Yeah. Put the name of their neighborhood on there or something. Yeah. Yeah. It, is there a uh, state tournament as well, kind of parallel to that, or different timing? Yeah, there's, yeah state, state tournaments are held now for uh, boys in the fall, girls in the spring. There's a single gender only. We don't run a uh, mixed state championship. We tried a couple times, and the interest was not there. And do you run them yourself, or not right them? now? Not right now. So there's, I mean, there's a, right now the USA Ultimate sanctioned events, and there's um, some other folks that manage that. So just Northwest used to be involved with that, uh, but then some folks want to manage it a little differently. So there you go. So um, finding, I want to segue now and talk more about you guys, about the coaches, um, and finding coaches. To meet player demand is one of the biggest hurdles to growth in our area. Um, and that is, you know, we have a lot of kids that want to play, but there aren't always good coaching options for those teams. And uh, what I mean, so if you have 15 kids that want to play uh, basketball in middle school, chances are, you know, of that group, there's a dozen parents that know enough about the sport to, to, to say, like, yeah, I would you know, be willing to teach. I could teach a kid how to dribble and shoot a shot, shoot a jump shot, right? But if you have 15 kids in middle school that want to play ultimate, well, Seattle chances are pretty good. You know, a couple of them have a parent that knows how to throw a forehand, but probably not too many more. And, you know, furthermore, it's not likely that that parent will also have the time and the desire uh, to be a coach, right? So just meeting this demand is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big issue um, for us, and I'm sure it's an issue uh, all over the place. Another, uh, I should say that there is a history of self-organization by the kids, and, and um, in fact, that's how a lot of the high school teams started. Kids graduated middle school, they formed the high school team, and went out and played. And I was back in the early days, and it's like, yes, more kids playing, great. Um, but uh, and there are values to this approach. There's a lot to be learned, especially when it's done well. You've got good leaders and so on. But um, having a reliable, sustainable team really does require good leadership. So I'm a little conflicted because when I was a kid, I used to, you know, well, I was like, go out, they'll come back until dinner time, and we just self organized and made our own games, and it was awesome. So there's definitely value in that, but in terms of what we're, what we're doing, we have a slightly different approach. So, uh, so we need coaches, we want to support them. How do we do that? Well, um, again, here's the theme again. One thing we try to do for coaches is to take over the administrative task as much as we can. For most events that we run, we do the scheduling, uh, provide the insurance, manage the website, administer the eligibility rules, coordinate communications, do all that kind of stuff. Um, we also work to maintain good lines of communication with coaches. Uh, we have coaches meetings before the season starts to talk about the league, but these are also great opportunities to collect feedback and find out what's important uh, from the coaches. And additionally, once every few years, we have uh, a youth summit which I mentioned earlier, which we collect feedback from the community about how we can do a better job of serving players, parents, coaches. Um, and like I said, it's really hard to find coaches for teams. Um, and I'll discuss recruiting coaches a little later on, but at this Northwest, we, we work with teams to try to find coaches. We have a page where we list job, job openings, try to promote that to, to our membership. Um, 
post a lot of messages on our website in general and send emails and use social media to get the word out. Um, and this is a difficult and time consuming process and there's a low rate of success, but uh, it's still a very important service to provide. And when you do successfully match up a person who's interested in coaching with a team that needs a coach, it really, it really is exciting. We also try to provide learning opportunities for coaches. Uh, we do this by hosting USA Ultimate coaching clinics. Uh, and uh, we provide information and resources for PE teachers across the state to improve the ultimate section of their curriculum. Uh, we do this at a, a WAPRD conference, Washington WAPRD, if you want to know what this is, Association of uh, Phys Ed, Health, Recreation, and Dance. They do a cool thing for PE teachers. It's really nice. And we went to one uh, a couple years ago, and I thought, um, you know, teachers from all across the state come, areas where there's no ultimate that I knew of, and uh, we thought we were going to have to explain what ultimate was. And, uh, you know, people would walk by and be like, what is that one? Oh, Ultimate? Yeah, you do that. Cool, you know. Well, what they actually needed was to answer questions like, what kind of disc can I use, you know? And like, well, how do I modify it for my population of small, big kids, whatever, you know, young, timid, whatever. And so we kind of modified our presentation, but it's still really cool to, to meet those folks. Um, we also try to provide a path for coaches to become more experienced and skilled at their craft. So, uh, like I said, we hire coaches for the YCC teams, uh, summer camps, some of the other club leagues we run, the clinics, and we, say, uh, we see that a lot of the former youth players, players that learned to, to play in Seattle, come back and serve as uh, coaches and volunteers in their camps, and we think that's, that's wonderful. They're becoming the next generation of leaders in the sport. Starting uh, last fall, fall 2013, uh, Disco Northwest began to pay stipends to coaches in the Seattle uh, public school, <coughs> high school boys league. So they play in the fall. So the public schools, so uh, pu private schools play in public schools as well. But the, uh, our youth strategic committee uh, stressed the importance of providing support for teams in, in Seattle, specifically in Seattle public schools. Uh, we have that great program that I mentioned for the middle schools, but the, for some reason not all those kids were able to find the right playing opportunity when they got into high school. So we wanted to remedy that. And, and um, most of the coaches at the schools that did have teams were not receiving any wages, any compensation or stipends. So, and we recognize that any kind of compensation uh, for coaches is a great incentive. And retaining coaches at schools is a great way to provide quality leadership and stability. So we started paying some stipends to those coaches. Hopefully that pays off and, and makes a more sustainable program. All right, so uh, we know you coaches have a lot to do. Um, but there are some things that organizers um, ask coaches to do that help us to manage successful events. Uh, we hope that coaches can be a communication conduit to parents and players. You know, we send out lots of emails. Our website's great, social media. Um, but sometimes the best communication is one-on-one, is -on -one, face to face with the coaches uh, and the players at practice or at games. And, and furthermore, sometimes we don't actually have accurate, up-to-date contact information for all the parents of the players, and we rely on the coaches to forward messages along to their team distribution lists. Of course, on-time registration payment, paperwork, obviously that's important. Uh, manage on -field managing on-field responsibilities. And, you know, so uh, Ultimate doesn't have refs or umpires or other kind of game officials that are out at the fields all the time. So... Uh, we need there to be some kind of adult supervision. You know, at a big event like Spring Rain, we've got dozens of people out there. Not as big a deal, but a lot of league games, we try to hire field marshals, have some folks out there with the schedules and the rules and, you know, help them to, to make things flow along. But a lot of times, it's up to you guys to do that. You have to set up the cones. Uh, you have to arbitrate the conflict if the soccer teams are out there thinking that they have the fields. You know, if there's question about spirit of the game, you know, rules or some kind of problem on the field, you got to deal with that, right? So this is, this is a big help that uh, you guys really provide. I think it's important for coaches um, to embrace other coaches from non-ultimate backgrounds. So, you know, and, it, and it's very important to continue to be a community that embraces new players, which we have always done really well, I think, to the sport. Um, uh, but it's also important to do that for new coaches. And, um, you know, sometimes coaches with the non-ultimate background, the sports background, sometimes they need help with spirit of the game or self-officiating. Um, I've seen this firsthand. And, uh, but, on the other time, sometimes they bring new strategies and perspectives that are really cool. And, and they also introduce the sport uh, to athletes that may not 
otherwise try. Um, so I want to tell you a couple stories uh, on that note. The first is uh, about Ken Brown. Um, so he didn't know anything about Ultimate when he formed a middle school team, and he brought them to Spring Lane to play, brought them down to Seattle. And they were very unorthodox, um, and they didn't really understand the rules. Um, and, was, you know, and that caused, that caused some friction among the, the, the other teams, and we thought we knew what Ultimate was about. I'm like, who are these guys? That's a pick, man. Don't you know that's a pick? And, uh, but over time, they came to be a great part of the community, and, and you know, the parents would start bringing their RV to Spring Rain and, and you know, uh, setting up tents and, and cheering on the team. And uh, Ken took an interesting approach. He, um, he took a cohort of kids, and he followed them from middle school starting in sixth grade up through twelfth grade for the ultimate. So he, didn't, he wasn't like just a middle school teacher. He was like the, the coach for these group of kids. Um, and it was pretty cool. And, and some of the players got on our YCC teams. And one year, um, took a team uh, to Western. It's got second place. It was that year when it was in Missouri, I think. The rough weather. Um, and this is a real success story for, uh, for us as an inclusive youth ultimate community. Um, my next story is about fighting at Spring Lane. And uh, what? Fighting in ultimate? In youth ultimate? Yeah, it, so it happened um, at the conclusion of a first round game between a Seattle team, came from a more ultimate background, and, versus a, a Vancouver team uh, that didn't have that had less ultimate experience and, and had some unorthodox styles and so on. The game was, was chippy, there were a lot of calls, um, and then during the post game handshake, there were there were there was there were some some fisticuffs and uh, very brief. But the coaches managed the situation um, before we even found out about it. <laughs> um, later in the weekend, um, they had a spirit circle, we got together, they talked about it, um, got all the all the players, all the coaches, and some parents together, and. Um, then in the finals on Sunday, that Vancouver team um, that was new to the sport made, made the finals in the B division. And they were playing a, a skilled team from Oregon. And uh, Vancouver was ahead in the second half, but Oregon was coming back. Um, got to game point. Um, the Vancouver team scored what would have been the game-winning goal. It was a foul call. Now, look back to that first round game. That, that team would have reacted aggressively, perhaps. Um, but in the finals, Column helps prevail, contest, send it back. Several passes later, they scored again, no call, they won, they won their division, and, and it was, it was, it, those players learned a valuable lesson that day. And, um, and they didn't need refs to kick people out or tournament directors to <laughs> kick people out. They managed themselves, and it was really the coaches, I think, that led, that were really instrumental in that in helping their teams overcome that, that earlier hurdle and, to have a successful event and to really understand more about what we feel is important about ultimate in our community. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. Did the uh, Vancouver coach have ultimate uh, background? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Coached a lot of other stuff. But I mean they had had a team for a year or two, but not you know okay. not very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, finally um, before I take your questions, yeah, run along. One thing that you can do for your team besides coaching, you can help find more coaches. Schools don't manage succession planning very well. Um, and we see too often teams fold when their leader quits, or retires, or moves on, or graduates, or whatever. And I want to highlight one quick example. Uh, Mr. John Sheet was a longtime coach at Bailey Gatzert in Seattle. Um, he had a large, a diverse group of kids in this program. There were girls in burkas running around, throwing the frisbees. And, and his teams were really good, and they were really fun. And um, he, was, he was a real Pied Piper. Kids followed him around and loved him. Um, but for all that, Mr. Jamshi was terrible at team administration. And we at this Northwest knew this. And so, you know, if we wanted him at Spring Rain, we'd, we'd have to call him, Mr. Mr. Jamshi, are you coming to Spring Rain? You know, so he wasn't going to fill out the registration form or do any of that kind of stuff. But we, we valued his participation and his team's participation. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, he left Belly a few years ago and the team folded. Um, the good news, though, is that he's now at Gene Adams and started a team there where there was none. It's another mid middle school in the area. And um, not only that, Mr. John Sheet has recruited a team parent to help uh, Phil Nick after he is not strong. And so last year, actually, they registered on time, and they paid on time, and they got all their paperwork done. And the kids had a wonderful time playing. And um, <coughs> it was a great experience for everyone. So on that note, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, and we do have a couple more minutes. And um, so uh, I would like to entertain.
Any questions from the audience? Yes? So you're talking a lot about this balance between uh, the newer, less experienced teams and the, you know, more stable team. How exactly would you move, because like I have a team in the area and we've kind of had this coach follow it, following us, but we're kind of on that side where it's very new and we don't always get the people out. How would you say to get from the less stable into the stable? It, yeah, as, as a program, how do, you, how do you mature as a program? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of it is time. Um, a lot of it is creating, you know, and maintaining sustainable practices so that the kids from year to year know that they're going to get a good experience. You know, if you're, a, if you're a freshman or a sophomore and you enter the team and it's a new team, there'll be, you know, things that are maybe a little haphazard or a little less organized than you might expect. But if, if certain structures are held together, if you, if you do hold practices regularly and, you know, you know have a coach and follow, follow your routines and so on, then the kid is more likely to, to want to come out again next year if they have a good time. Whereas if, you know, practices get blown off, half the team doesn't show up most of the time, mm -hmm. you know, game day, kids show up 20 minutes late, and this and that, you know, that's going to be a little detriment. So, so start doing whatever you can right. What, what, you know, take any piece of what you think an organized structure team looks like and start doing that and hammering away at that and build upon that okay. every year. Yeah. I'm kind of curious uh, about the transition from individuals doing, you know, a bunch of work in the community, setting up tournaments, setting up a team, into, you know, a, a, a more administrative structure where, where you have a bigger pool of volunteers where it, it's going to outlast any one individual who steps up to do something. And, yeah. You know, we, Colorado has always been based at almost every level on, on some individual who does something, they do great, but, but pushing through to that next level where, you know, there's mm -hmm. some continuity and, and, you know, some resources and stuff. Is, yeah, so how do you make that transition? Yeah, yeah so, yeah, becoming something that, uh, a group that's depending all on volunteers to a more structured organization with staff or what have you. I mean, um, a lot of it will be kind of forced when your when your leaders and your your what I call Uber volunteers yeah. stop doing what they're doing. If they don't train somebody else or nobody steps in, you have to do something. And that's kind of what happened in Seattle. It got to the point where managing this Northwest was a it was the the board did it. It's a very operationally focused board, and there was a volunteer executive director. And then the job got more than she could handle, and the board decided, well, if we want to keep doing this, we have to hire somebody to do it. And it wasn't clear whether that would be fully funded or not. It was a bit risk, risky, but did it. And then <clears throat> that, you know, we still had a lot of Uber volunteers doing stuff, um, but that took a lot of the administrative work off of off of the plate of that volunteer. And so it it, it really took buy-in from the board, you know, understanding from the community that you know there's going to be a paid person to do a lot of stuff now. There wasn't really too much pushback on that. I mean, some people were curious. Well, what do you do in this ED? Well, oh, that, that yeah. money came from tournaments. To yeah, so all all the money, all the revenues are operationally focused. I, so when the first so it started with a part time ED in two thousand one, and it was Mike Karen and uh, I think it was that one, and part of his job was to figure out how to fund his job, because mm -hmm. um, it was partially funded in the first year. And this is actually how we've done it almost every year when we hire staff, increase staffing levels. You know, we'll go into the red first year mm -hmm. and then figure out how we're going to do it and then go back into the black the second year. So part of Mike's job was to figure out how to fund his position. And he actually he had tech skills. He was an IT guy. So one of the things he did was made a lot of changes to the website, made it easier to manage the wait list, and enforce um, the, the players to submit payment for hat leagues, because a lot of people figured out they didn't <laughs> no, nice. uh, need to do this. Yeah, they didn't show up and play, right? And so, it's like, but, but there was a wait list of people that wanted to play. So it's like, oh, well, if I just tell you these people that don't pay, you're off, and then get the wait list people in. And you get it. He did that in a year and then paid for his position. You know, and, and you'll find that as you have people who's, if it's their job, they're, they're more accountable, they're putting time and energy into it, you're going to be able to, to develop more programs. You're going to be able to find, you know, you can find more programs that, are, that, that bring in more money, more revenue, that let you do more things. And um, you can end, you can deliver higher quality events. And then that makes it easier for you to raise fees. If you need to, right? Ultimate's still really cheap compared to a lot of other sports, youth level and on the adult level. But you know, if your schedules are coming out earlier, 
you know, there's better communication to the players. The website looks better. Still getting good fields and everything. It's easier. To, it's easier to say to the players, "Hey, like, we're, you know, we're going to raise fees five percent this year," and they don't. It's not a big deal, and then that helps you continue to, to support your program and your organization. We've done that. We got to the point that with the youth director, you know, I was doing everything and, and it was great. And then youth is a completely different customer because you're not just dealing with the adult player. You're dealing with the, with the youth player. You're dealing with the parent. You're dealing with the coach, the athletic director. And there's different questions. There's different kinds of liability, a lot of different issues. And so it became more than I could handle on my own. The boards realized we wanted to continue to grow youth programs. I mean, we could have... If we were just running adult leagues and, and some tournaments right now, I, I could make more money at my job. You know, the board could pay me more, and it would be a very sustainable model. But that wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to promote Youth Ultimate as well, and so we made that investment, hired part-time youth director. Actually, Frank was our Frank Hernandez here, and Speaker was our first mm -hmm. part-time. Lost a little money and then, then made money, and, and then became a full-time job, got an operations manager, and then we just hired an administrative assistant, because mostly because our customer service on the youth side was was getting in the way of uh, Wynn's ability to do her job and deliver quality programs. She spent half of her time just answering emails, which is important. Uh, Got to answer those questions, and you know, uh, it's it's very very good work, but um, it's not something that somebody her pay grade should be spending that much of her time doing. Anybody else? Well, I think it's about time anyway. Um, thanks again for coming. Uh, I love talking ultimate. <laughs> um, especially about structures and practices and, and organizations. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to send me a note. I've got my cards up here and stuff. And um, I wish you all good luck in your future endeavors wherever you head off to. Awesome. So thanks a lot. Awesome.